Um, I just want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Bonnie Gutman. I am the executive director of the Dance Palace, and I'm really happy you guys are joining us tonight. Um, our, we are new at being a virtual dance palace. So uh, Dewey has agreed to be one of our first folks that is doing um, an event. Um, and we do have some really interesting things coming up in October. So I just wanna give a, a quick overview of what's happening. Um, on October 11th from five to 6 p.m., Laurel Ann Riley, who is a locally grown emerging artist and educator is presenting a new body of her work called Home Inside. And this is the Dance Palace Art Committee's inaugural online art show. Since we can't have live lobby art shows right now, um, they're going online. So she's got a really great show of watercolor mixed media that she's been uh, creating over the past nine months while she has been sheltering in place in Uruguay. Um, so this will be an event with a, that's a conversation with her, discussing several of her pieces, followed by a Q&A. And um, so I, I wanna recommend that. And then on October 18th, from 4 to 5.30 p.m., Sky Nelson Isaacs is going to do a live presentation called Can a Science of Synchronicity Change Our Lives? And this presentation looks deeply into physics and cosmology and will focus on the power of grief to cut through our filters, get us into a flow state of mind, and help us choose. Our sorrow, when it can be felt, has the power to change our behavior. So that will be another really great presentation. And then on October 24th at 7 p.m., we will be having a discussion with Dan Newman, uh, who wrote a nonfiction graphic novel, so I guess it's a non-novel, uh, called Unrig, How to Fix Our Broken Democracy. And he and the artist, uh, who's a well-known artist named George O'Connor, will be outlining key problems in American democracy, proven solutions, and stories of activists working to affect change. Um, he will be, they will both be in conversation with Chris Desser, and that event will be in partnership with Point Reyes Books and KWMR. So you all will be able to find these events on our website at dancepalace.org. Um, and then I'm just gonna mention really quickly, uh, Dance Palace has put together a survey to find out what community members would like to, to see and hear and learn about and participate in online while we can have the building open. So we just sent it out in our e-blast this week. And uh, if you didn't get it and would like to get a copy, uh, feel free to email me, uh, bonnie at dancepalace.org, and I'll put my information in the chat later. Um, and then I also just wanna mention, uh, when you have questions for Dewey's presentation, please put your questions in the chat, not in the Q of A or Q and A, um, that has been disabled. So please make sure they're in the chat and I'll be curating them at the end of the presentation and we'll get to as many as possible. And then I just wanna mention that this event is free, but we do appreciate donations to both the Dance Palace and the Jack Mason Museum. So, and the way that we're setting this up is you can dance, donate to the Dance Palace and then we will be splitting the proceeds with the Jack Mason Museum. And I'll be putting the link to that uh, in the chat as well in a few minutes. And so now I wanna introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, I'm very excited. Uh, Dewey Livingston has 35 years as the mostly volunteer historian with the Jack Mason Museum and other historical societies. He's also a professional historian in California. He is the map archivist for the Marin County Library's California Room. And I just found this out. He was the Dance Palace Tech Director back in the 80s. So we're very excited about that. Um, so I just want to go ahead with that uh, to introduce Dewey and uh, on with the event. Thank you. Well, thanks, Bonnie. And uh, thanks for inviting me to uh, come and do this virtual event. So um, yes, uh, this is quite a different situation to come and talk to a computer in a room by myself and knowing that there's well 112 people out there right now uh it's very different from talking to the room i've been doing this since uh, 1986 i think i gave my first talk at the dance palace and uh we had a big crowd that was the old dance palace and uh, ever since we've been doing this and people have been uh, very interested in what uh, uh, what I have to show. So I'm really, really happy about that. Um, and uh, I just sort of wish we were all here together and I could, but I know that that's just not 
the way it's going to be. So I'm set up on the standard Zoom thing. I have my best shirt on and my grubbiest shorts, and uh, we'll be uh, ready to go here in uh, uh, with this talk. So I'm going to go to share my screen now, and we'll start the show. All right. I call this swimming around West Marin's past because uh, some of the pictures we're going to see have to do with Tomales Bay and swimming. Um, we're going to be looking at this old uh, uh, photo album as part of the show. And it's still swimming weather. Uh, it's been smoky, and so it hasn't been uh, that perfect. Uh, but today, for instance, was gorgeous. So uh, this is sort of the idea that we're swimming around. We're going to cover a couple of topics today, two or three, maybe even four. And uh, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, as Bonnie said, uh, I used to work for the Dance Palace, and ever since I was a fairly young person, the Dance Palace has been very important to me. Uh, it was in the 80s when I worked here, I got to meet um, uh, most of the people I'm acquainted with today, uh, because I was just there all the time for a few years, and my daughter was little and some other kids on the way. It was a really great time. Uh, and so uh, the Dance Palace uh, uh, really is one of those places that uh, needs our help uh, during this uh, period of pandemic. Uh, so many people are struggling and agencies and organizations. So um, I thought it would be fun to do this, uh, to help out the Dance Palace and also uh, throw a little the Jack Mason Museum of West Marin History's way. Now, people ask me all the time, although now I'm not running into people on the street so much, how's the book coming? Because I've been writing a book on the entirety of Point Reyes Peninsula, Tomales Bay, and the towns around. And uh, all I can say is, well, it's coming along. Uh, it is uh, at least two years late, but I've been working uh, on it. And I just have had a lot of other things going on. I have to work for a living. So I thought I'd show you just for a couple of minutes here some of the things I've been doing uh, so that you don't get too mad at me for uh, being so late with the book. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the last years examining places like this and structures like this. Uh, if this was a live audience, I'd say, uh, who can guess what this is? This is a uh, 120 year old corral in Mojave National Preserve made out of juniper posts and iron pipe tied together with wire. And it's among the structures that I've been inventorying and then listing on the National Register of Historic Places. I've been working on this for almost 20 years. These are the Dove Spring Corrals in Mojave National Preserve. This is a really wonderful site here. It's way in the wilderness. You have to hike about an hour through desert landscape. There are petroglyphs and a spring back in those mountains behind. Um, and it's been a really uh, wonderful job looking at all these places. I've been uh, working at getting old historic cattle ranches onto the National Register. This is the Kessler Springs Ranch and uh, has a lot of interesting structures and buildings on it made out of railroad ties and juniper posts. And unfortunately in the dome, in, in the SEMA dome fire uh, last month, most of this uh, complex burned down. And so we have to amend these National Register nominations to reflect that they're not here anymore. But most of the uh, place survived. And then the other thing, especially in the last two years I've been working on has also for Mojave National Preserve on contract is putting the uh, historic Mojave Road on the National Register of Historic Places. It was built in the 1850s following an Indian trail and uh, uh, was used by the military and by pioneers uh, going from east to west and uh, uh, used by uh, a number of people uh, throughout those years up into the 1880s. And this is it winding up SEMA Dome. Uh, this is also in the area of that fire. But you can see the beautiful Joshua Tree Forest. And this has been a really interesting project. It's just about done. Here it is going down into Paiute Canyon. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of old work from uh, 150 years ago. Uh, putting together National Register nominations is very time consuming. They're very technical. They involve uh, uh, getting every little bit correct. You have to dot your I's and 
cross your T's and uh, I go back and forth. I have over 200 emails with the historian I work with at the State Historic Preservation Office and put together these lengthy nominations with maps and photos and a lot of text. It's really interesting. And, uh, but uh, this is largely how I make my bread and butter. Uh, Carrie came along on our field trip back in October. And so we got to enjoy the beauty of Mojave National Preserve uh, for a few days after the field work was done. She was my note taker and, and uh, it was very rugged out there in a four wheel drive, very remote. And uh, but if anybody wants to hear some good places to go in the Mojave, the Eastern Mojave, let me know. And then also I took on a job not long after I started the book with the Marin County Free Library with their Ann T. Kent California room as their map archivist of this new collection of over 30,000 historic uh, survey maps of Marin County. And uh, I work about eight hours a week on that. And uh, it's a really interesting job. Uh, this is a picture taken by Ruby Clark. She came to document a day in the life. And these are the kind of documents I get to play with and learn from and share with the public uh, from that wonderful facility. And I've also been writing for the California Room. They have a blog on medium.com and, and a, quite a few of my writings, there've been over 20 of these, uh, quite a few of them are about West Marin. And um, so you might look at medium.com slash Ann T. Kent Room. And if you search Dewey Livingston, you'll find my articles, but also all the others that are in there are very interesting. Notice there's one about the Vision Fire, which started 25 years ago yesterday. So um, uh, that's uh, uh, very timely and with the Woodward Fire. Uh, and I should just plug, uh, I'm gonna do a talk for KWMR on October 17th about the Vision Fire, about my experiences because I, worked the fire as a cultural resources specialist uh, following the fire trucks and looking at places uh, uh, with the bear team. So, so um, that's pretty much what I've been doing. So let's get into some history. Now, usually I'll show a bunch of pictures and I love doing these before and after. Uh, this is sort of after and before views. You see it's lined up at what it looks like now and what it used to look like then, Point Ray Station the little area right south, Mike Contos's field and how it used to look. Uh, these are a lot of fun, Olima, and then going back uh, over a hundred years. See, I love how these line up pretty well. And you can see, uh, you can see the changes, especially landscape um, where a lot of places were a lot more, this is the Inverness Mesa, were a lot more uh, open and, and barren or there were cattle grazing or, or this or that. And so looking at the changes is really uh, fascinating. Uh, and then here's our Hog Island Oyster Company and for a little dose of nostalgia going back to when it was Salmina Brothers General Merchandise and you could stop along the road and marshal there and buy some gas too. Now I was gonna spend a fair part of this time looking at old survey maps and comparing them to today, like I did with those photographs, but I've changed course a little because of the Woodward fire, fire. So I'm gonna talk about Bear Valley, but I thought I'd throw in just a couple of these. Um, this is the Olima Cemetery as it was laid out by George M. Dodge, the surveyor in 1880. And he made a very precise layout on the acre of land that was available to him. Notice up in the upper right, there's a potter's field even. Um, and compare it to uh, how it looks today from Google Earth. And hey, they followed his, um, uh, uh, his plans just like it was a city being grown. Uh, so uh, uh, I found that to be really interesting. And then a, a place that I've been fascinated with for years is called Muldrow City up on Tomales Bay. It's between Cypress Grove and the, the Strauss Dairy. Um, Muldrow City doesn't exist, but it showed up on a government survey map in the late 1880s and a little misspelling. So I looked into it more and I found this survey map from 1862 showing that a little city was starting. There was a hotel, um, a lot of people living there. It really turned out to be a scam by uh, a guy named Muldrow, called Colonel Muldrow. But um, so it never really took off. And if you go to the exact site today, 
you wouldn't know that anything happened there. There's Highway 1 going through Mickey Ray's house up on the hill. Um, and, uh, but uh, instead of doing a whole lot of this, and I've done some of this before and you've seen it, I'm going to uh, give an abbreviated version of a talk I gave to the Point Reyes National Seashore Association a couple of months ago about Bear Valley, because Bear Valley has been on our mind a lot with the Woodward fire. And uh, so I thought I'd look into a little of the history uh, there, and you might see some images that'll be uh, of interest to you as far as your concerns about the fire. Now here's a Google Earth view, not particularly great, of the Bear Valley headquarters looking out towards the Bear Valley Trail, but isn't it nice to sort of close your eyes and think about what it was like uh, before uh, our, us modern type humans came and st started messing it up uh, or settling it. There's all sorts of ways to, to look at it. Um, but uh, looking at Bear Valley, it's a particularly beautiful area and it has a very deep history, uh, a rich area for the Coast Miwok, but was taken over by the uh, Mexican government in the uh, 1820s and 1830s. Rafael Garcia, who was a soldier at the San Rafael Mission, uh, was awarded this whole area of Olima and down the Olima Valley as a land grant um, that was uh, confirmed by the U.S. government after California became a state. Uh, so they made these maps that uh, of the boundaries. Uh, you can see Rafael Garcia's house in the lower left and his corral in the center. And the corral is right adjacent to the town of Olima now. And if you look at the top, you see Taylor's warehouse. Well, that's the location of the Green Bridge. That was Samuel P. Taylor's warehouse where boats would come right up to there and bring rags for the paper mill and uh, uh, take paper back to the city. That was fairly short-lived, but uh, it was a, a very important place uh, in West Marin. Bear Valley was sparsely settled after Garcia's family uh, moved off the land. There were a lot of squatters and people setting up little uh, uh, shacks and sawmills and the, things like that. Um, pretty wild in there. A lot of wood cutting, not necessarily for lumber because the lumber wasn't great, although some sawmills were set up that moved around, but mostly cordwood. And nearby, starting in the late 1850s, a little town called Olima, which is based on a Coast Miwok word, was, uh, a was started uh, at the crossroads of the trail to San Rafael and the trail down to Bolinas and the trail out to Point Reyes uh, proper. Uh, on the site of Garcia's hacienda and sheds and barns, and he had a big cattle operation, but he had to leave that area because he lost it in uh, the litigation over the land grant boundaries. Uh, one of the members of the family of that litigation uh, 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 victors uh, built a large dairy ranch right there, what we call Bear Valley Ranch, it's the headquarters. This beautiful big house which sits on where the park headquarters are now and uh, was, a, was a very high quality dairy. They also had three satellite dairies because the Bear Valley Ranch was almost 8,000 acres. Um, so there were three different satellite ranches. The one at the bottom uh, was the Y Ranch. Remember that the ranches of Point Reyes were given letters of the alphabet. So why one of the last letters of the alphabet out at where Kellum Beach is now um, is, is right down below there. Uh, this whole area burned in the Woodward Fire recently. And then above you have the Campili family at their ranch called the U Ranch, the letter U, which is where Coast Camp is today, which is near where the Woodward Fire started. Um, the coastline in those er those times were, was much more open and grassy because it had been grazed by uh, elk and native grazers and then the, the cattle came in and then the dairy cows with all these little dairies and, and it was uh, uh, a more open environment. The picture on the top, these were taken in 1928, shows you those castle rocks which is near where the Woodward fire started and I remember a dramatic video of fire burning around those rocks, which are just south of Coast Camp on the Coast Trail. 
And then the third of the satellite dairies was the Z Ranch, the last letter of the alphabet. And it was up near the top of Mount Wittenberg where a sky camp is today. And again, look at the landscape up there. Open grassy hills is almost as far as you can see. Uh, and that was a result of a few things. Of course, in the early, uh, 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 very early days, the Coast Miwok used fire to keep a lot of these grasslands opened. Um, and then the coming in with cattle and dairying, you saw a little more clearing and, and of course, a, a whole different uh, a type of grassland landscape. But uh, the fact of Mount Wittenberg's baldness has always been fascinating to me. You look at any old pictures looking that direction and Mount Wittenberg is almost as bald as Black Mountain. Um, I believe this is mostly a natural phenomenon, although the grazing, of course, um, added to it, it slowly started to close up in the 30s and 40s and head towards the, uh, the summit. And, uh, but even uh, in our memory before the vision fire, it was, it was, it was quite uh, different up there. So I'm gonna show you some comparisons from the air. Now, you're not gonna know where you are here, maybe, but you have Olima over on the right. So I'm gonna give you a few uh, keys here. If you see the Bear Valley headquarters on the right, the Fox Drive area up above the Sky Trail heading up to Mount Wittenberg, just a little below the center, the Meadow Trail that heads down to the Bear Valley Trail over uh, in the bottom there, and then the Clem Miller Education Center uh, and the Youth Hostel over on the left. So um, we're looking basically down at Mount Wittenberg. And if we go uh, to, another view of this in 1952. This is lined up almost precisely of the view we're seeing here. You're going to see a very different landscape. You're going to see that Mount Wittenberg and a lot of the ridges around it were open grassland. The meadow down by the meadow trail was quite large and many of us remember that because that meadow has only been closing in with Douglas fir uh, and other vegetation more recently. Uh, and then it's also interesting to note though, over to the left, you see that there's a lot of land that has been mechanically cleared. This is 1952, this is after the war. A lot of ranchers had bulldozers and, and, and the equipment with chains and things like that to clear brush. And so you see a lot of mechanical clearing to the left. You see what I believe is mostly natural open grassland in the center. And um, uh, it has uh, really, um, uh, especially in the 25 years since the Vision Fire has uh, closed in uh, quite a bit with new growth of Douglas fir and a little farther to the north, Bishop Pine. If you look at this area around Mount Wittenberg, you can see that a lot of that that is uh, going into the former grasslands is new growth, is young trees. And this is a lot of what burned in the Woodward Fire more recently, I suppose I should say some is still burning. But that fire also went farther to the east down into areas that have never burned in anybody's memory. But I miss those times when Mount Wittenberg was just a bald knob. We hiked up there all the time and you had a 360 degree view all over. That's me back in my kind of hippie days. Uh, but you had just a wonderful view up there. And after the vision fire and a lot of seeds apparently coming through, uh, the Douglas fir has taken over the top. The landscape really has changed a lot around Bear Valley too. This is, uh, you can see over on the left, this is a Jack Wisby painting. You can see over on the left is the Bear Valley Ranch. There's the, the red barn, which used to be white. Uh, and the marshes on the right were filled with willows. They were dense willow marshes that were um, cut during World War I to make charcoal a big charcoal operation. And if any of you remember Jimmy Alberigi, he told me a lot of detail because he worked with his father in, um, in making charcoal. Uh, and so those, um, those wetlands between uh, uh, Olima and Point Reyes Station were stripped of their vegetation. A canal was made and uh, forage plants, uh, forage crops were planted and eventually it was used as grazing land. So that, that area at the bottom of Air Valley has changed quite a bit. Um, I love to look at things from the air as you can see from any of my shows. This is looking down at the Bear Valley Ranch in 1952, now the park headquarters. Uh, that's the Prince headquarters up uh, 
up towards the top in the meadow where the where the horse, uh, where the Morgan Horse Farm is, and you can see the Bear Valley Trail heading out toward to the left into Bear Valley. But one of the most interesting things about this is you can see the San Andreas Fault uh, slicing through diagonally. And if you go from the woods of Bear Valley, you can see that little trickling, uh, meandering Bear Valley Creek coming down past the hayfield in the lower left, and it suddenly hits the San Andreas Fault and then follows the fault straight uh, to the to the north northwest um, and uh, it's just really neat to look at patterns on the land in the lower right you can see the canal that was made to eliminate all the meanders in that willow uh, 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 area and those willow marshes uh, because the creek used to meander through there and it does now again because uh, the creek jumped its uh, it's, bound, it's bounds uh, about 20 years ago, and that's been returning to a willow type marsh. But the earthquake uh, shook things up, no pun intended, but uh, here, here's the rift of the earthquake just uh, north of the Bear Valley Ranch. Uh, and look again in the distance and look at all the open hills coming down where uh, Silver Hills Road goes up and Inverness Park. Uh, those were all part of dairy ranches, some was cleared and some, according to uh, the oldest uh, 1850s maps, had some natural grassland in there. Here's the famous picture of the barn at the W Ranch, the Bear Valley Ranch. And you can see how they, it went right through the barn. It, uh, it shifted the uh, trees in front of the ranch house about 20 feet. But Bear Valley attracted people for its beauty, starting a long time ago when people started coming to West Marin for pleasure on the stagecoach and then after the railroad came in 1875 you saw um, people coming out wanting to enjoy the scenery and the Bear Valley Ranch was for the most of the time open to the public uh, as long as they behaved themselves and didn't start fires and leave trash and things. Um, you could go out the Bear Valley what we call the Bear Valley Trail today it was a road then and, uh, and enjoy uh, the sites and have picnics and excursions. Um, it was a very popular place for, uh, uh, to get a special stagecoach. This is the country club I'll tell you about. Um, had, uh, uh, had wagons that took you out. You're, you're looking up at Divide Meadow uh, on what's now the Bear Valley Trail. Um, wonderful excursions, hiking, riding horseback, uh, taking a wagon or a buggy. And, uh, and getting out to the ocean where you could go to Arch Rock and, and enjoy a lot of the beauty out there. In 1890, a group of uh, men from that exclusive Pacific Union Club in San Francisco uh, made arrangements with the Shafters, the owner of all of Point Reyes, uh, to establish a country club. Now, we think of country clubs these days as where you go and play golf and, and sit in the clubhouse and drink or do whatever you do and have parties and and uh, but back then a what a country club was was that you had the city club um, and those were very common all around the world in London and San Francisco and New York there'd be these clubs men's clubs women's clubs uh, and this was starting to establish country clubs um, which meant that it was your clubhouse out in the country um, this was largely a uh, hunting club for socializing, but also hunting. They had quite a, uh, an, a spread of, uh, of buildings out there at what we now call Divide Meadow. Uh, the elegant clubhouse, um, a barn for horses, uh, dog kennels, uh, and it was, a, it was a popular place for the, um, the, the limited number of people who were allowed to be um, uh, members. Uh, for those of you who like to go picnic at Divide Meadow and you take off from the Bear Valley Trail and go up into the meadow there under those big trees, this is what it looked like during the heyday of the uh, country club. You're looking back towards the Bear Valley Trail. Um, but it was very exclusive. It was, it was uh, I'm sure it was a great um, uh, uh, example of, of, of white privilege. Uh, these were the powerful men of San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, women were allowed in, in limited uh, uh, capacity and at certain events and this and that. Two of the founders of the country club were named Woodward, 
Uh, I don't know whether they were brothers or father and son, but um, James and Charles Woodward were among the founders. And that's what gave the name to Woodward Valley, the Woodward Valley Trail, and hence the Woodward Fire. Uh, they had gamekeepers there, and so there was a lot of hunting, uh, mostly of deer and uh, imported uh, birds, and there were fishing in lakes. Uh, but they also went out, uh, the gamekeepers, and hunted the predators that they considered to be uh, bad, and uh, were sort of horrified to see this picture because they brought in a beautiful large mountain lion, and they practically exterminated them, and, and perhaps they did for a while. Um, so I sort of hate to show the picture, but that was one of the realities of what was going on back in history. Now, another uh, attraction at Bear Valley on what's now the Bear Valley Trail was the state fish hatchery. And in 1891, the State Fish Commission uh, had this hatchery built uh, at a location where there was a lot of fresh water. They built a dam and a reservoir, and they had uh, 24 troughs inside this building that was 40 by 20 feet. Uh, and the troughs were for hatching uh, up to a million eggs. Of, uh, at start, they started out with uh, Eastern brook trout. They brought 225,000 eggs from Nevada and then planted them in the local creeks in, in what they called Fish Hatchery Creek right there and Bear Valley Creek. Um, and, they, um, and they apparently did quite well. Then they went into um, Quinnett sal Salmon and in 1896 brought in almost a million eggs and uh, the salmon uh, grew quite well at the fishery and then uh, were released. And they all headed straight to the ocean. They knew what to do. And um, uh, apparently that was a success, but it was introducing a new kind of fish. Uh, in, in all of these cases, it was the government trying to do something good. Uh, but uh, there was a complaint that there were so many fishermen coming out. Uh, if you look at the newspapers in San Francisco, there are regular columns about fishing at Bear Valley and Paper Mill Creek that most of the fish that were planted were were taken <laughs> or were fished away. There was barely anything left. Um, this little operation only lasted about 10 years and its location, which I promised in West Marin's past to reveal to you, is right where the meadow trail comes down and meets the Bear Valley Trail. You'll see that there's a creek coming down there. And uh, you wouldn't know it today, but that's the, uh, the Bear Valley fish hatchery. The owners allowed people to build their own cabins if you were in with the, the family. The Orr family built this cabin out towards the coast on the Bear Valley Trail. They called it Bugville. And they had plenty of guests and parties and uh, a good time uh, out at these places. Uh, there were a number of cabins lining what's now the Bear Valley Trail. Uh, the Menzies cabin is familiar to some of us who might remember it was this was torn down in the early 70s. These are on little pieces of property that were uh, sold uh, by Payne Shafter to, um, to some individuals. There was a little row of houses right as you went in the woods on the Bear Valley Trail, leaving the trailhead. Uh, this was one of them. The Menzies family Robert Menzies was not the famous Menzies botanist, but he was an amateur botanist and very interesting, interested in uh, plants. He, he planted the beautiful dogwood that's there that I think shows in the background here that uh, has bloomed every year since the 1920s. It's been damaged quite a bit. He also in the late 1940s planted a Dawn Redwood uh, right on Bear Valley Creek. And you can see it there if, you're sh if your eyes are sharp enough, if you keep a lookout. Uh, as you're coming into the, as you're going through the forest, it's on the left. Uh, and it was one of the original seedlings brought from China after the Don Redwood was discovered by, by Western botanists. So uh, a really interesting little compound here. We had the Boy Scouts meeting at Bear Valley. They had a camp here in the early 30s of the depression. Uh, but mostly it was an agricultural scene. It was the Bear Valley Ranch, the W Ranch, which was largely a gentleman's farmer type situation with wealthy owners. Um, here's where the parking lot 
of the Bear Valley Trail was. You see it was a hay field for quite a while. The visitor center would be over on the far left there. Uh, the Bear Valley Dairy Farm developed into one of the first sanitary dairies in the Bay Area where they shipped their milk that was especially clean uh, to hospitals in San Francisco. There's the old ranch house in the back. Um, and uh, uh, the first owner after the Shafter family, the Howard family, who were in-laws of the Shafters, um, uh, sold it in 1919 was uh, the Rapp family. And he was a wealthy brewer in San Francisco. And uh, so they sort of set it up as a retreat from the city. Uh, he made sure that the dairy was improved and was a super quality dairy, but, but this was a place where the family could come and enjoy themselves. They dammed Bear Valley Creek and made a, a, a little reservoir there for boating around. Uh, he built a, a retreat house up on the hill uh, to uh, welcome his friends and hunting partners and, and this and that. Uh, quite a number of gatherings there at that beautiful old Redwood house. Uh, now that is now the Prince of Headquarters. Uh, it's been quite remodeled by the later owners, but um, uh, that location was uh, established as kind of a retreat area. Um, uh, the Bear Valley Ranch went through another owner into the Langdon family and uh, was quite famous for the quality of its milk. This is uh, one of the part of one of the murals in Coit Tower, and it depicts the milkers at the Bear Valley Ranch. And you see they're wearing white uniforms and everything is, is, is very clean and tidy, uh, at least according to the, the artist. Uh, the, it looks like he's even uh, washing over on the right. He's washing off the cow's rump. And uh, so everything was really kept uh, as sanitary and good as possible. And so the Bear Valley Rancho, being so large, again, almost 8,000 acres, um, uh, continued to be an attraction and continued to be in the news. Uh, the Langdons went broke and lost it to the bank. And it was sold to Gene Compton. And uh, if you're into San Francisco history, you might have heard of the Compton cafeterias. And in fact, uh, one of them was uh, notorious in, in uh, the gay rights history um, with the uh, incident at Compton's cafeteria in the 1960s. But um, Gene Compton had a lot of money uh, and he built a lot of new buildings and tore down the old ranch house and, and improved it into uh, uh, continuing it to be a premium dairy ranch. Um, you see a lot of barns that aren't there anymore, but the big white one is still there as our red barn. Um, uh, they had a nice entrance. It was, it was really the, the show place of West Marin for quite a while. And again, these are wealthy owners um, who really use this as, as a side attraction, um, uh, keeping the quality of the agriculture high, but um, it was sort of their sideline. And that was true of a couple of other ranches on the point that were, uh, on the Southern point that were owned by wealthy um, people who used them um, as their retreat areas. But still the life of the cowboy, this is out at that Y ranch that I talked about earlier where uh, Kellum Beach is. Um, and the, uh, the whole uh, ranching tradition continued there for many years. And it was Compton who hosted the Bear Valley Rodeo in three years in the late 40s. And this was an attraction from people from all over the West came here. It was an accredited uh, Western Rodeo. And uh, it took place uh, at where our Bear Valley Trail takes off um, uh, from the headquarters, from the visitor center area and into the woods. Uh, they had big grandstands and a, and a full rodeo grounds that uh, uh, brought uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people uh, during those periods when the ro rodeos were going on. And so this Bear Valley area uh, has gone through quite a transition. It was a cattle ranch. Uh, it was a dairy ranch that turned into a cattle ranch when the Kellum family bought it. And uh, Mrs. Kellum was one of the Spreckles families, and Mr. Kellum was the son of, a, of George Kellum, the very prominent architect in San Francisco. 
Um, they turned it into just a cattle ranch. Uh, the old barn got painted red, but wasn't really tended particularly well. You can see it looking a little faded here in the late 50s. Uh, here is Divide Meadow back when it was still ranch land and the beautiful wildflowers that came up in the, in the pastures. Uh, and I recall some cattle here when I first started hiking here 50, some, 50 years ago or so, um, just as they were being phased out. Um, and the Kellams sold the property to the federal government after Point Reyes National Seashore was authorized in 1962. Here's President Kennedy in that September day signing the authorization uh, for the National Seashore. That's Clem Miller up to the right behind him holding the book very happily. Uh, and proudly uh, watching the event. Clem was our local congressman who sponsored the, uh, the Point Reyes bill in the House of Representatives. And uh, unfortunately, a month later, he was killed in a plane accident as he was campaigning for another term. And he was buried out at the end of Bear Valley. Uh, and this little tiny plot here was the first piece of property to come into the National Seashores uh, ownership. And uh, his grave is still out there. It's a different scene. It's a little hard to find. It's not grassy. But um, Clem Miller is somebody that we can still remember uh, for all the work that he did in making Point Reyes National Seashore a, a reality. So they established their headquarters at, the, at Compton's old ranch houses and uh, staffed it with rangers. This is starting in 1962, 63, and started to acquire land. It wasn't until 1972 that the park was officially established after enough property had been purchased and brought into the park. But in those early days, they had some pretty interesting plans. This is the 60s. This is when everything was booming in the suburbs and the highways. And so you see this plan for Bear Valley, and it had a four lane divided highway going through, basically a freeway going up into the uh, National Park. And if we zoom in on it a little, the Bear Valley area up in the upper right, you see the admin and maintenance site. That's where the headquarters are now. There were campgrounds with a campground expansion, picnic sites down in the marshes um, uh, and around where Cooley Loclo is now. And then these, this four lane highway, two lanes inbound, outbound, heading one over to Limantour and one over towards uh, over the ridge towards the Lake Ranch and Wildcat. And luckily none of this happened. Uh, the Limantour Road got built, but not as a four, line, four lane, and it didn't even get finished because there was a more conservation oriented point of view coming in at the late 60s and into the 70s. And, and it nixed most of this, uh, uh, what you might call wild development. And so the National Seashore focused more on interpretation and education and uh, 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 preservation of natural resources and cultural resources with allowing the ranching, uh, a limited amount of the ranching to continue uh, in the National Seashore. And there were friendly rangers on horseback. Here we are back on, on Mount Wittenberg. Again, a different scene because all the grassland or most of the grassland is gone, but um, uh, Point Reyes National Seashore has been quite a success and we can't wait for the trails to open again and have a look at, uh, at what the fire has uh, done up in that area. So this Bear Valley area went from a ranch to a people's place. And I like this little transition. This is my daughter Molly's class visiting and it's right at the same spot where they used to herd cattle across and here's Lola and, and, and Dave Green <laughs> uh, herding children instead. And we can consider that to be a, a nice uh, transition. Now I'm gonna go into, we're about, uh, oh, I'm about 40 minutes in, so I'll talk another 20 minutes or so. We're gonna go into another uh, uh, subject at all. This is based on a photo album uh, that documents the house and the family who built the house called Yifto in First Valley, Inverness. Um, the Leal family built that beautiful little house and, um, 
and one of the relatives, I believe it was cousins of the Leals, kept this photo album. And uh, it's in the, it was recently donated um, by uh, philanthropist Jeff Kramer to the Antique Kent California Room. And uh, I've been looking at it and helping to interpret it. And I just thought it was such a nice album that I wanted to uh, show it uh, to the public. Uh, it's full of photographs. There's, there's uh, about a hundred pictures in it. And the theme of the album is Yvto, which is the house that they had as a summer residence. Uh, that was a name that Elsie Leal, one of the daughter, one of the daughters, uh, named the house. Most Inverness houses had a name. Uh, it was based on an old story of a French king of a small uh, kingdom in France. And uh, she had read the book and thought that would be a nice name for their place. The owner and builder, her father, was Captain William G. Leal, and he uh, was a San Francisco Bay captain from the 1880s up until the time he died in 1917. Uh, his main occupation was running the steamer, paddle wheel steamer called the Caroline. And his bread and butter for that was to, to take it back and forth that served San Quentin prison, uh, brought in supplies and goods, transported prisoners, um, uh, and uh, uh, did, mainly focused on uh, the prison and the back and forth that was done there. But he also led excursions uh, around the bay on the weekends, and he would take up to 100 people on this steamer uh, to, to attractions like on uh, Paradise Cove and, and into Sausalito and, uh, and maybe up the Sacramento River a ways. Uh, he was a very popular person and was known for the stories he could tell. Well, he and his wife, Lily, wanted a retreat out in Inverness, and so they built Yvto. And by the way, this house has just been uh, being remodeled, uh, restored in a way, because they're doing an excellent job. Uh, it was about to fall down, and so um, pretty soon Yvto will be back to its original glory. Well, here's the photo album and how it looks. Here's some of the pages. You can see that there are, you know, five to six pictures on each uh, page. They're usually very high quality, some kind of fading, and they have, uh, a lot of them have these notations, and we're going to look at some of those. I like that the opening page you look at, the, the owner of the album has written in, pleasure is our code. And that was the whole spirit of coming to West Moran and to Inverness for the summer. Usually people would come for the entire summer. Um, maybe the husband would come back and forth to work, but, but um, <clears throat> for the mothers and the kids, it was just a, 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 a wonderful time of freedom. Um, so the photo shows the interior. I, I, I'm assuming this is Yvto, might be a neighbor's, because I was in there uh, not long ago and I didn't recognize the scene. But um, some, that's a rare interior view going back that far, 1898. And then all these pictures with clever little sayings. Um, here's the child on the sand dune, a hard worker. These are all on Inverness beaches. You know, you had sandy beaches all the way from downtown Inverness to uh, Chicken Ranch which of which there are very few left now. Here's the morning gossip. I'm gonna assume that one of those women is Lily Leal and the other might be her sister-in-law because Captain Leal had a brother named John who was also a San Francisco sea captain. And uh, this uh, album I believe is the album from the John Leal family, the cousins who came and also spent summers. Here's a hasty retreat, goes little one of the little ones. That could be my granddaughter running into the woods for all I know, or my grandson. By the way, that's another reason I'm late on the book, just because it's so much fun playing with them. They've moved to Inverness. Here's a maiden meditation. A lot of these pictures have a really nice atmosphere to them, a really nice sense of, of, of place and um, the peacefulness that you might find in the beauty. Stop, she cried. 
I don't know what they're really talking about. Maybe it's the woman there with her mouth open and saying, stop telling funny jokes. But I like also the chair that they have built out of uh, branches and this and that from the local woods. Haircutting, 25 cents. Looks like he's already lost some of it. Le petit garçon. I think that's a really cute picture. You can see how they used uh, branches and this and that to have a more rustic feel to the area. But so many of the pictures in this album just tell the story, tell you a visual story of West Marin and Inverness in that period of time, 1898 to around 1900, 1901. The old post office, the original post office that was right across from the Gables where the Jack Mason Museum and Inverness Library is today. Um, and uh, uh, just some, some nice views around what people did, how they had their time of leisure. A few picturesque views where you can kind of compare, even though this one's a bit faded, you can, you can compare vegetation, you can see uh, uh, this is Mount Vision. You can see it's fairly bare on the top. And um, well, the big fire came down here in 1927 and changed this landscape. And now it's very different from today. I believe this picture was taken from up on uh, the Mesa or up on Vision Road. This is a wonderful picture of a bike excursion, the women uh, taking off. Maybe that's the road around Dream Farm and all the alder trees. I'm not sure the exact location, but I really like this picture. Uh, again, has a lot of atmosphere, has some, some action to it in a way. And uh, imagine just taking off uh, on your bicycle down these dirt roads when there wasn't traffic, there wasn't all the road building <laughs> trucks coming through, which we're, we're uh, uh, seeing right now. Uh, and just quiet and a lot of fun. The photographer or photographers took a number of portraits. This might be Captain Leal, I believe it is, uh, posed at one of the rustic gates in the neighborhood. And I like this one, the two women meeting at the gate. Just a lot of, what should I say, a lot of humanity in that. I love that picture. And then this one is one of my favorites too because there's always some room for goofing around. That was the swimming attire of the day. Going out on excursions, picnics, look at they all have their buckets and their, with their lunches in them or something wrapped in paper with string, heading up into the hills. Coming back with greens that I suppose they might take back to San Francisco or to use for um, displays around the house. And then of course the bay and swimming in the bay. And um, boy, I, you must have felt, they must have felt quite weighted down uh, with their modest dress. And here's our picture that we use to advertise. I just think of people having so much fun in those days, it was a more organized fun. It was, it was, it was, it was really almost a thing of the past. And then the children on the beaches with the bathhouse, bathhouses in the back where you could change and keep your things, have a padlock on it, and keep your beach stuff and your buckets and and your towels and and uh, and so you could just come down and pick everything up and have some fun on the beach right there and make sandcastles and with your big bonnets keeping that wicked sun off their faces. There are a number of pictures of picnics and I'm always interested, what were people eating and, and how did they prepare for these picnics? They'd come in in a rowboat up the bay. This might be Heart's Desire or Shell. And, um, and sort of looking, they, she has a box and a, and a can, maybe there's milk in that can or cream or maybe there's coffee. Uh, Here's a, a scene out in the dunes on the other side of the, of the uh, Tamales Point. And you can see they probably have a bottle of wine there. They have cans, they have muffins, fruit. 
uh, sandwiches, and they're dressed for the occasion. Or they went out to the beach, to the Pacific Ocean, and here you sort of lose your modesty. Oh my gosh, I see some uh, ankles here. Oops, I even see some thighs. Oh, forget about that. Um, I'm sorry to if there are anybody I've offended from the 19th century. A number of pictures of taking their excursions in these wagons. This looks like it's out towards the Bear Valley area. And just imagine the the sounds and the smells and, and the, the being in this spring wagon, being pulled by horses um, through the landscape, going slowly, being able to talk and being able to point out the things that you're seeing and to stop where you want and get out and to have a picnic and then come back tired late in the day uh, after being with all your friends. Seems like a lot of fun. This picture was labeled on the road to Olima so this is what's now Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. Or you might go out in a little trap like this with a pony, a little two-wheeled excursion. This would be a lot of fun. This is best for maybe a boyfriend and a girlfriend, a way to take her out and steal a kiss. I don't know. They have some other scenes, like here's White House Pool. It's almost like a painting looking south there's the White House of White House Pool. And here's White House Pool looking the other direction. It was a popular spot for swimming. And look at how wide the creek was there back in those times before the levees. And Sir Francis Drake was just a dirt road going past. You might even visit the Bear Valley Ranch. Remember, it was open for the public. And uh, there they are at that old Bear Valley Ranch house. I was especially thrilled with this album to find some rare scenes. This is um, something I've never seen a good photo of, which is in the horse era of haying, um, where they're doing everything by hand. The horses will pull the cutters, the mowers, the horses will rake it up. Uh, the workers will take it with pitchforks and load a wagon very carefully, quite a quite a science to it. And uh, uh, this is a very rare uh, view and I was just thrilled to, to see it. I'd like to find the exact location. It's somewhere around Bear Valley, I'm pretty sure. And then another one that was quite interesting to me is the charcoal works. Now I don't know the exact location of this and this is before the charcoal kilns that I was talking about um, during World War I. Um, so I don't know the location, but on one of their excursions around the Point Reyes area, they came to this charcoal works. And this is where trees would be cut. They were green and stacked in a certain manner uh, and burned uh, with a certain amount of use of water. And uh, they were burned into charcoal and then it was, it was all put out and you, you um, had quite a little industry there. Fairly destructive, it looks like. Um, but uh, very, very, uh, very interesting and a very rare view uh, to, uh, to add to our knowledge of what people were doing in the Point Reyes area uh, 120 years ago. They went up the bay and this is another rare photo. This is of one of the houses in one of the coves farther up on the west shore of Tomales Bay, what's now the National Seashore. I'd like to find this location I'm suspecting that this might be the area south of uh, Pelican Point where the elk fence comes down because at that location there was a guy around this time in the late 1890s who was allowed to live there. He built a cabin. He had wonderful gardens and flower gardens and it was quite an attraction for people on the bay to come over and visit him. And uh, I would love to be able to figure that this was maybe one of his house. One of, or maybe this was his house. There were also um, a number of settlements over there that were still occupied by Coast Miwok descendants. And um, uh, this could be one of those too. So it would be very interesting to find out. There's a little barn behind. There seem to be gardens. Uh, let's uh, find out where this is someday. But again, this album is just full of of, of life and, and rare views and, uh, and even some romance because this is Elsie Leal, daughter of 
Captain and Lily Leal. And this is her boyfriend, Bruce Johnstone. And Bruce was an attorney in Chicago who came west. Uh, he was quite involved in the early Sierra Club. He knew Stephen Mather. He knew Horace Albright, uh, Gilbert Grosvenor of the National Geographic Society, um, uh, uh, a great uh, believer in public lands. And he put his attorney skills uh, to help out uh, a lot of those ventures in the early part of the 20th century. Well, he, had, he somehow met Elsie and they fell in love. He came out to Inverness quite a bit with her. They got married. Uh, they came to Inverness every summer from Chicago until they finally uh, settled here in 1941. Bruce uh, Johnstone and Elsie were very much involved in local activities and some pretty important events. They were key in the founding of Tomales Bay State Park uh, and in bringing the Greyhound bus to Inverness so people could get to work. Um, and uh, many of us remember uh, Alan Johnstone, their son, who lived in Inverness, uh, retired here after his career, and was a big teller of uh, stories about growing up in Inverness in the 20s uh, and in that house called Yvetel. Uh, the Bruce and Elsie built a new Yvetel up on the hill on Perth Way, uh, which is still a, a showplace, beautiful house um, uh, of Inverness. So that's just a wonderful album. I could go on and on. We could show you every picture, but we're running out of time. Um, there were a few more things I promised. So if you're still with me, I hope we haven't lost too many. If you're asleep, that's okay. Because these next ones, I, just, I love looking at old papers. I get a lot of information from them. I know you have to keep it a bit with a grain of salt, but there are a lot of uh, things that you just can't deny, basic, basic, uh, like when the date of something happened or, but also you run into a lot of really interesting stories and a lot of history like 1881 in the Marin County Journal, where it documents A.P. Whitney building the first store in Olima Station. Now this is Point Reyes Station, originally called Olima Station as the train stop. And it, it talks about the stone foundation wall enclosing a large cellar. And that is still there. That's the cellar under the, um, the Western Saloon. Uh, the, the, the building on top is different because this stone building had fallen down in the earthquake, but the cellar is the uh, remaining uh, uh, part of the original store. And it's how he's going to finish it really fast. And it stands near the Hewitt's Hotel, which was on the Grandy Block. And it says, as a business point, Olima Station offers great inducements and Dr. Burdell, who owned most of the land, has ideas that are very favorable to good tenants. Uh, we're gonna get a couple of private dwellings and a blacksmith shop. So this is the real birth of Point Ray Station documented in the paper. You'll find advertisements that are interesting. This is for Point Ray's butter, pickled roll, pickled roll butter. And um, this was probably not the very best of the Point Reyes butter because usually you would want it fresh. And this is packaged in kegs in brine, but for pretty cheap. Uh, uh, you could get 31 pounds for $8.37. Uh, but anyway, a lot of interesting ads. Sometimes there's an illustration, this in the San Francisco call of a hunting expedition to Tokoloma. And the artist may not have really been along there. I don't know that that really looks like Tokoloma, but um, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of interesting little illustrations you find, especially in the city papers. Um, cute little stories that tell you more than just what this, what this says. They lost a gilt ball from their flag staff, the Boy Scouts. And what this indicates was that they walked from, they marched, walked from Tokoloma back to um, Petaluma. Red Hill, not the San Anselmo Red Hill, but the Red Hill, which is where you go over from Nicasio Valley, um, or over, I'm sorry, from uh, uh, Hicks Valley over towards Petaluma. And uh, they lost their gilt ball, but this gives us the impression, at least, that they walked all the way from Petaluma out to Point Reyes and uh, walked back. I can't say that for sure. 1921, improvements at Point Reyes. This is the empty lot. Uh, is will soon be occupied by a new garage and sales room. This was what turned into Cheetah's garage. 
um, then the Station House Cafe, a few things in between, and then Stalina, which recently closed. But um, this is the basically announcement that they were building a garage and a sales room, and that's what that building on the corner uh, was in its first 20 or 30 years of uh, business. Ooh, get into Prohibition, 1925. This is the Tokoloma Resort. Cesar Ronke. Now this building still stands uh, right there by that old Tokoloma Bridge, but it's it's been falling down for years. But uh, uh, he had a, a a restaurant and inn here called Caesar's. Uh, he also uh, had Caesar's Grill in San Francisco. He was considered considered to possibly be the person who invented the Caesar salad, but um, they were arrested uh, for by prohibition agents and charged with violating the Volstead Act. No doubt they had some booze there, but there was booze all over the place. So um, uh, this was just one little incident. The sad story of the Palacios who drowned in their wine vat in their house in Point Reyes Station. He went out to stir the wine. This was legal to make your own wine during prohibition. Went out to stir it and got over come by the fumes and fell in. And when his wife came out a while later to see how he, what was going on, she fell in too. Uh, you can go visit their sad graves at Alima Cemetery and there they are side by side with that 1926 date. Um, this is a, not a very good clip, but um, it just points out Cheetahs Park in Tokoloma. Um, there were a number of places to gather and Don McIsaac took me there. It's where the Cheetah Ranch driveway takes off. Um, and uh, there was a, a wooden dance floor down by the creek and, and all these facilities for having big parties and dances. Uh, you wouldn't know it today when you went by. Here's Grandy's Garage in 1928. You recognize that? That's Cheetah's Garage today. Uh, nice greetings from Adams and Salachi. This is the uh, founders, or Salachi at least, of the Palace Market. Uh, and I just love what they say here. This is a New Year's greeting and they say that um, uh, we're here to serve the local people in all matters and do our portion of the civic work that is necessary for the upbuilding of the district. And I think that still holds true with that our storekeepers and, and business people in West Marin uh, do everything they can for the community too, with uh, donations, well, to the dance palace, et cetera, uh, for fundraisers and events. And that's an old tradition here. This was interesting, 1937, a crew of men is at work at what seems to be quite a new industry here. Large laurel trees are dug up by the roots and the stumps gathered for shipment to Germany for furniture manufacturing. They weigh from a ton to a ton and a half and sometimes more. They are begin, being trucked into the Bay region for shipment. I'd never heard of that. Did you know there was a service station, a gas station and service station in Inverness Park? Well, here's, here's a little note of who was running it in 1939. And even getting into the closer times, 1952, where Robert Marshall of Marshall Beach, farther north, he owned part of what's Tomales Bay State Park, 33 acres. And so right above Heart's Desire Beach, and that was bought for $15,000 to make the park complete. Or 1964, where Inverness residents, uh, the Inverness Association, called the Inverness Improvement Association, considered making Inverness a city, incorporating, but they needed at least 500 residents and there were only 400, so it wouldn't come across, uh, it wouldn't be able to happen. And if you look in the lower right, I don't have the complete article here, you see that they're hoping that they, with the park coming, that they will close Sir Francis Drake Boulevard beyond, beyond Inverness so that the new roads that I showed you earlier would be the way into the National Seashore and there wouldn't be a lot of traffic through Inverness. Ooh, if only that had happened. This was a fun one and I'm gonna finish up here. I'm going over time. Uh, but uh, looking into the history of the Station House Cafe because when it was announced that they were closing, um, I started to point, look into it and published a thing in the Point Reyes Light about um, how it was 1964 when it was started, not 74, which uh, was what Pat Healy had 
really used uh, as, as the benchmark. That was when she took over, but it's really 10 years older than that. And I was able to find uh, that Willie and Hild Hildegard Rabine started the cafe and um, their daughter contacted me, phoned me up and said, you know, this is my parents. And she was able to tell me a whole lot of things about um, this early restaurant, which was a farm to table type place. Um, they grew their own potatoes and vegetables uh, and, and got local beef. And, and, and by making the worn out old building into a cafe it was considered to be a, a great improvement for Point Reyes Station in uh, 1964. Um, and this is a picture that the family shared with me uh, uh, of uh, Willie in the center and uh, to the right is Hilde or Hildegard, his wife. They were from Germany and they came over here and, uh, and started a restaurant with wonderful food and, and coffee. So, uh, so that's the, uh, the origins of uh, the station house. Well, so let's bring it to a close with newspapers. It was, it's really interesting to watch the Point Reyes light and watch it change through the different owners. And when Mike Gehagen had it from 1970 to 75, it was about the same time when, when a lot of new young people were moving to town and starting families, a big cultural change, a big shift in, in West Marin history. And he started having uh, uh, extensive letters to the editor and dialogues back and forth on what was going on and about the environment. And, and, and it's really neat to look at those 50 year old newspapers and find that a lot of the issues they were talking about then are still being talked about today. Uh, and then I threw in a little ad for the Bonnie Thistle gift shop in Inverness. And if anybody listening knows something more about that, I'd love to know. Um, so, I've gone five, six, seven minutes over, but I want to thank you. And this will be the end of the uh, show. Um, and we'll be able to take some questions that you might have put in uh, the chat or perhaps even some, uh, some comments. And, uh, but I thank you for coming in. Maybe you'll stay with us for the question and answer. I'm not so sure, but so I'm, getting out of my screen. And I think we're going to hear from Bonnie here in a second. Okay, the voice from beyond. <laughs> um, Dewey, I just really want to thank you. This was a really fascinating, interesting presentation. Um, I, this, this is just fantastic. So I just want to thank you again. Um, we do have some questions uh, from folks that, that are here. Um, the first one is, is there documentation on the burials in Alima Cemetery Potter's Field? Uh, yes and no. Um, here at the Jack Mason Museum, I'm sitting in our archive room. People think of the museum as the, the where we have displays in the Inverness Library, but the but the meat of this place is this archive room. I mean, I mean, I could show you around a little, and. Um, not too long ago, we had a donation of the original records of the Olima Cemetery from its beginning. And it has a number of burials in the Potter's Field. Um, it has a map of the cemetery too, uh, on a board. But that map is the, is the plan for the cemetery, the layout. And um, so there, I don't believe you'll be able to locate it. And it appears to me that the Potter's Field has is no longer used that way. I, I know, in fact, some people who are buried there who were not, um, uh, you know, w w that shows that that was no longer used as a potter's field. So that's an interesting question, and it's one that I would like to know more answers to. But we have a number of the names of the people who were buried there. One was a was almost a boy who was who was uh, who died who drowned in a in a shipwreck off of Point Reyes, for instance, um, and uh, who was an, a young English lad. So yeah, um, we know something. And here at the Jack Mason, you can contact us and uh, you can contact me and uh, we could look into that. Okay. Uh, the next question says, there were no trees in Alima, were they planted? <laughs> uh, that's a big subject. Um, when I was a teenager and in high school here in Marin, I kept hearing that Marin used to be covered with redwood trees and that that the loggers came and cut them all down and the ranchers came and started dairies and that's why there, there's all this bare land. 
Um, that's not true. Um, uh, if you look at the cutting of redwoods, um, the, the volume of redwood timber coming out of here that seems like a lot, 20, 30 million board feet, you're really only talking about a couple hundred acres um, for some of those figures. Um, there were vast grasslands. Now these are very different from today's. Um, now around Olima, I believe that most of the trees that you see in Olima were planted. Um, cypress, uh, the yard type of trees, the, the, um, and then a lot of the, of course, the native oaks and buckeyes and this and that. So much was cut um, for cordwood uh, and it just depended on the situation if they grew back. But um, uh, for the most part, I'm pretty confident that it was a nice mix of grassland, uh, more of like a savanna with oaks, and then the forests where you pretty much see them today. That's, that's something that we could do a whole uh, program about vegetation change in West Marin, and I wouldn't be the entire, the, the whole, uh, you, you'd need to get some other voices in that too. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, uh, the comment is, it was such a wonderful album. Is the photographer known? No. And, and we're not entirely sure of the owner of the, the original, the person who put it together. But I, but I say that it was a Leal cousin, probably. Uh, I'm suspecting that it's a daughter or wife of John Leal, who was the brother of um, Captain William Leal, because there are a couple of photos where it, that are noted as um, Uncle Will, and uh, and that and his those photos match the drawings we've seen of William Leal. So by saying Uncle Will makes me think that it was William Leal's niece or nephew, probably niece. Okay, uh, I have a question here. Where is Tokoloma? Uh, Tokoloma. I guess there's not a sign there anymore. Uh, when you go over the hill on Sir Francis Drake heading east from Olima, you go up over the hill and then you come down and across a bridge and there's the McIsaac Dairy Ranch there, that's Tokoloma. Um, it's the beginning of the Cross Marin Trail or the beginning of that segment where you can park there and there's the old bridge that's, that's there that was bypassed by the new bridge and there's a big old falling down building right adjacent to that that I mentioned which was Caesars Tavern. There used to be a much bigger hotel there but that was downtown Tokoloma. Um, it's been in the news more recently because of the houses that are farther east, there's, which was part of a subdivision along the creek in the 1930s. And they've been calling that Tokoloma, but so that's more suburban Tokoloma. So Tokoloma was at the corner of Platform Bridge Road and Sir Francis Drake. Uh, next question is, could you please repeat where Clem Miller is buried? Yeah, if you go out the Bear Valley Trail all the way to the end and then turn left on the coast trail that crosses Bear Valley Creek and goes up into the hills, it's up in there. Uh, I, uh, you, you, can, you have to sort of search around because it's not a standing stone. It's, it's almost flush to the ground and it's surrounded by pretty heavy brush, but, but there are deer trails and people go and visit his grave. His family, I believe, probably still do. Um, but that's as, that's as close as I can get for a description. Okay. Not, far, not too far from the, from the okay. creek, up on the hill. Uh, next question is, can you tell us more about Eve Tote? Is that the cottage at the end of Inverness Way South? Yes, it's the one, it's the one right before you get to the split where Laurel takes off. Um, uh, it's the house that's been being worked on uh, uh, with new shingles right now. So it's, it's not the very end of First Valley, but, but it's, it's almost to the end where the road splits back there. Okay. And, uh, you know, Leah Johnson lived there, uh, jo Johnstone lived there for quite a while. Uh, and um, who else? Um, well, anyway, it's up there. Look for the house with the new shingles. Okay. Um, next question is, how do you know approximately how many bears and for what kind of bears lived in the Bear Valley area? I couldn't answer how many bears because if you're going back to time when it was the Coast Maywalk here, you probably hunted them, but to not a great extent. Um, I 
I just don't have any kind of number for it. I understand they were fairly plentiful. As far as the kind of bear, I've heard they were California grizzlies. They, I wouldn't be surprised if they're a brown bear or a black bear, but you know, I'm not, not enough of an expert to say. You might ask somebody at the park. Um, uh, but my understanding is that there were grizzly bears here. Uh, they weren't around much by the late 1800s. Uh, I don't recall hearing a bear sighting after the year 1900 or so. Okay, and I have the last two questions here. Uh, the first one says, please mention the exhibit for when the library opens. Oh yes, and, and, and that was actually uh, uh, on my list to do as a graphic and I forgot. Um, Meg Linden uh, put together a wonderful exhibit on the history of the Bear Valley Ranch at the Jack Mason Museum of West Marin History. Uh, and we don't know when the library is gonna open again. It's in the reading room of the Inverness Library. Um, but I know that the library system is working on it, on making plans. I would doubt that it's in October, but I can't really say. It'll certainly be announced when the library is open again and, uh, and you'll be able to come in probably to a limited extent as far as how many people can come, but, and come see that exhibit. It's, it's really good. I'm sorry for forgetting to mention that. Uh, it's about the Bear Valley Ranch. It'll, you'll see a number of the pictures I showed and a lot more um, very good information. And, and, and thanks Meg for uh, leading the way on putting that exhibit together. The Jack Mason Museum I should mention is uh, part of the Inverness Foundation. Uh, we have our own nonprofit uh, well, they're, they're the nonprofit, but we have our own uh, uh, bank account and things like that. And we have a committee that runs the museum and, and things have been pretty much on hold for a while. But, but like I mentioned earlier, this archive room is, uh, is where things really happen. And this is where we have Jack Mason's collection. And also we've probably at least doubled, if not more, the size of Jack's original collection uh, over the past uh, 35 years since, since he passed away. Okay, and then the last question is, which bridge is or was Platform Bridge? <laughs> um, there are uh, dueling, dueling stories, because Don McIsaac told me that the Platform Bridge was the bridge there at Tokoloma. We have old pictures of it, and the problem is now Platform Bridge is literally a platform strung across a creek that has some sort of supports um, but it was a truss bridge. So to get technical here, I don't believe that a truss bridge is called a platform bridge. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm coming to the point of where I'm going to admit that I'm not really sure which one. The graffiti bridge on the other end, uh, by below Nicasio Reservoir, is likely the spot. I've never seen a picture of the bridge that, that was there before, um, before they built the concrete bridge in 1937. Uh, and I, the reason I know that date is because remember in, uh, uh, when the Golden Gate Bridge had its 50th anniversary in 1987, um, we, we found out that because it's printed on the side that that bridge was built in 1937 too. So Dave Mitchell and I and some other people put together a, a bridge walk because they were doing that at the Golden Gate Bridge to celebrate the graffiti bridge. And it's 50 years. So we had a whole little thing and we rocked across the bridge the you know, 75 feet and then had a little speech. And anyway, that was fun. Uh, anyway, that might really be, and I wish I could answer, but it's one of those where you get conflicting, uh, conflicting information. One thing I can tell you is that from, from that bridge into Point Reyes Station on Point Reyes Petaluma Road, that used to be called Black Canyon Road. I kind of like that name, Black Canyon. Anyway. Okay, so I think that's it for all the questions. Um, I'm gonna pop back in here with you, but uh, I just wanted to thank you again so much uh, for doing this. I, this was fascinating and I could sit here for hours, <laughs> just listen to all of this. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, this was really great to have so many people tune in. And uh, I have put something in the chat, but I'll mention it again. 
Uh, if you want to tell the Dance Palace about what types of programs that you would like to see, you can email me, Bonnie, B-O-N-N-I-E, at dancepalace.org. We're uh, in the process of um, putting out a survey to the community so we can forward that to you. Um, and uh, Dewey, again, I just really want to thank you. Uh, this, was, this was really terrific. And uh, Ken Adams, who's hiding in the background there, is our AV tech person, and I want to thank him as well. So uh, thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks for having me.